I want to thank you, first of all, for that beautiful silence. It always says a lot, you know, that we are capable of entering into a covenant with our own inner self. I was going to look in your eyes this morning to see if you had established the eternal day, but I'm afraid I can't see your eyes from here. But I'm going to catch up with you before it's over. <laughs> Jesus made a very important statement, something that we must look at and try to discover for ourselves exactly what it means to us. He said, I'm going to leave now. I'm going to leave the world and go to the Father. And I'm quite sure that his words were not understood. I am leaving this world and going to the Father. You find it in the 16th chapter of John. Why would he have to leave the world to go to the Father? You know the Father is omnipresent. What was he saying? Do you have to leave the world to go to the Father? And when you leave the world to go to the Father, where do you go? You are going to do exactly that as you have done many times. Every time you leave the world, you go to the Father. And when you stay in the world, you're separated from the Father. Or else why would you leave the world to go to the Father? So in this statement we find that when you are in the world, you are separated from the Father. A very simple statement, but a very deep one. When we are in the world, we are not with the Father. And most of our lives, we are in the world, patching up some problem, thinking that if we can just patch this one or the next one, we can then get around to the business of perhaps being with God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. Where do we seek the kingdom? We cannot seek it in the world because the Father is in the kingdom. Jesus had to leave the world to go to the Father. If we wish to seek the kingdom, we cannot seek it in the world. We must leave the world. But there's an important word in that statement Seek ye first the kingdom. And so where the kingdom is is certainly not in the world. And when to seek the kingdom is first, not second or third. And so all of the patch-up problems are based upon the fact that we are still in the world, not first seeking the kingdom. And the truth is that we didn't really know how to seek it. We try to find the Father in the world, and we try to find the kingdom in the world, and we cannot. The world must be crucified in your consciousness. And when you leave the world, you don't even have to step outside the room. You don't have to get up off your chair to leave the world. 
There is no time external to your mind. All time is in your mind. And if you wish to crucify time, that's where you do it. If you wish to leave the world, that's where you do it. If you wish to find the Father, you leave that which separates you from the Father. And that is your time mind, your time sense. You're living in a dying time, a dying world. And there, outside of your sense of a dying time and a dying world, right here is the kingdom. Right here is the Father. And so we must now look at omnipresence to see that it automatically excludes all time. There is no time and omnipresence. We have been unaware of a very subtle way in which we give away our lives. We talk of omnipresence, but we live in time. We talk of omnipotence, but we live in time. And we talk of omniscience, but in time we use a second mind, not the omniscient mind. We live in a second mind, a mind that is not omniscient and is not connected with the omniscient consciousness of a father. It's so subtle that we miss it. Now, you may feel very capable and able to, at all times, control your life to your satisfaction. If you are, you're a very rare individual. But there's one thing you cannot control, even if you are that capable. You cannot live an hour from now. Try it. You have to wait for that hour to come to you. You cannot live now at two o'clock. You have to wait for it matter who you are. You cannot recall an hour ago. Your Friday is gone. Your morning before this moment is gone, irretrievably. And if you want to look closely at your life, you'll see that you're only living this second. And then this second is dead. And now you're waiting and the next second comes and you live in that second. And you live in each passing second. And that's what we do. And we think those passing seconds add up to life. And that's what we're here to discover. They do not. They are not even a good imitation. God isn't waiting for an hour from now or for tomorrow, or for the 21st century, and neither should you. Right now, there is a different permanence available to you if you will take this passing second and dwell in it for a second and then look at the next second and finally see that this pattern must be broken. As long as you live in the passing second, you're just flitting through life on a superficial basis. You must expand your time span. For example, if you were told to just stick your hand in a jar and everything you can hold in your hand belongs to you, it would be unfair to people with very small hands, wouldn't it? Only the ones with big hands would come out with something resembling what they like to have. Now, the time span is somewhat like that. What we enjoy or experience in our time span depends upon the width of that time span. And if you're living in this second, and you have no other life than in this second, and then the next second, think of what you're missing. And think what would happen if you could expand your time span. Just think what that would imply. 
Suppose you could live yesterday, today, and tomorrow, or right now. Suppose you could live the next ten days within this time span instead of in this second. Does that sound ridiculous to you? God surely does. I'm sure that the Spirit of God lives in the fullness of its being at all times, not in the fraction, not in the passing second. And yet, we who have the same privilege as the Son of God have not been taught nor have we examined this fleeting moment. And so we let the life of each fleeting moment go by, and we're content to think that's the maximum we can do. And now if we can just fill those fleeting instants with good things, we're satisfied. Anything good or happy satisfies us. Never realizing that it's in the fleeting instant. And so our time span must be expanded and our consciousness expanded beyond our present time span moves closer and closer and closer to the reality of the kingdom. And when your time span extends beyond your lifespan, you have discovered immortality. And you know why Paul said, put on the garment of immortality. And you know why he said, lay hold of eternal life. Because in our time span idea of life, our whole lifespan is but a sequence of fleeting seconds. It's really a horrible truth to think that mankind has not seen beyond that. And in those fleeting seconds, whether they run 20, 40, 80, or 100 years, they're only seconds pasted together. They are actually an untrue sequence of your life. They no more resemble the reality of you than day resembles night. We are told that today is a new day because the earth is rotated around the sun and that the earth is now kicked over from one side of itself to the other side. And so it's a new day. And then it'll kick over again, it'll be a new night. And we accept all of this. We accept all of the evidence that our senses give us and we never question them. Whatever they say, we just nod passively and accept. But there is a place where there is no night. And there is a place where there is no passing second of pain or suffering or lack or limitation. And it is right here. And it is a place where there are no solutions needed to improve anything. We may have dreamed of such a place and passed it off as something that only exists in a dream. But when we awaken from the dream of passing seconds, there is such a place where there are no patch-up required for anything. Nothing has to be solved. Nothing is wrong. And there is a consciousness which can live there, a consciousness which requires no activity to remedy or correct or in any way solve a situation which may be distressing. In your infinite way work you call it the principle of no power. If you will carry that principle of no power into your awareness that you stand now in the living kingdom of God and not in dying time you will discover that all of the patch-ups and solutions that had been necessary are no longer necessary. Just as there's a law in this country that thou shalt not kill, and another law that thou shalt not steal, and another law and another law, there is a law in the kingdom, and it is a law of perfection. 
There's nothing that can change it. It cannot be defiled. The difficulty is that there's nobody in the kingdom except one who has accepted and lived in their perfection. And so your entrance into the kingdom here, where no power is needed and no solutions are needed, is your acceptance that you are not that creature called mortal who lives in each passing second and calls that life. Because that passing second of life is not divine life. And if that is you, if you are that mortal, you and the kingdom are separated already. Now to put on the garment of immortality then, you must look at this passing second and you must overcome the illusion of it. And that is why you'll find I am leaving this world now and going to my father. In this world of passing seconds, there is no God. There is no activity of God. There is no love of God. There is no law of God. And you will see all around you the evidence that the law of God does not function in the passing seconds of a dying world. Everything in dying time is already dying. Everything in passing time is passing. And you cannot live in this dying time, which is called the world, and be one with the Father at the same time. Now, I hope you can clarify that to your inner satisfaction that leaving this world does not mean giving up your family, your business, your home, your life as a visible being. It means adding a new dimension of awareness to what you are. It doesn't mean going down to mom, putting a lock on the door, and saying, I'm out of business, I'm leaving the world. Instead, it means bringing your business into the kingdom of God, bringing the kingdom of God into every phase of your life, and looking at every limitation with the knowledge that it only exists in these passing instants. And now step out of them. Step back. Step back out of the passing instant, which is the trap of time. It's called the bottomless pit in the Bible. It's telling us there that what we are trying to do is to build a life in a bottomless pit, where everything ends. Step back out of the passing instant. Watch how when it passes, you're still present, and now try to find something that did not pass. Don't take the next passing instant. You're going to find behind the passing instant something that did not move, something that is here always, something that is the Spirit of God that does not move when the passing instant moves by. And hold on to that. It is a substance. It is a real substance. Nothing can move it. That passing instant did not touch it. That passing instant is now gone, irretrievable. But this substance remains. This substance has always been here. It is the same substance that was here when Jesus said, and now I am leaving this world to go to the Father. He was catching the now. He withdrew consciousness from the passing instant. He held fast to the now that is permanent, not moving into a yesterday. 
And every tomorrow that moves into now and moves out of now is already dead. Do not buy or accept or live in this future time that is going to come into the present. It's an illusion. This unpassing now, behind the moving instance, is the kingdom you will learn to live in. And when you live in it, the law of grace will embrace you in every possible way. Seek ye first the permanent now. Live in the permanent now. Get the feel of it. Trust it. Surrender to it. Yield all that you are to it. Know that in the permanent now is your true self. Nothing is moving it. It is here. And tomorrow will come and go, but it will still be here as it has ever been here. It did never begin in time. It will never end in time. It is the timeless now. It is real. Be ye perfect as your father. Your father lives in the timeless now. The law of perfection is the law of your being in the timeless now. Always here. And when you think of omnipresence, remember that omnipresence is about the timeless now, which is always present. No matter where you go, if you were to take a plane to another country, the timeless now that is here will be the same timeless now that is there. You are walking through it, and you must learn to live in it consciously, so that wherever you are, you are in the timeless now, where the law is grace, perfection, harmony, my peace, not as the world giveth. You are in that timeless now, in your immortal self. And the moment you attain an awareness of either your immortal self or the timeless now, you are omnipresence itself, all erode into one. We're living in omnipresence for the moment, and we want to go up the coast of California. And everywhere we go along the coast of California, the senses are going to say to us, here's another city. There's the ocean rolling in. There are more people. There is a disturbance. There is a problem. There is a canoe turning over. There is a bicycle that has just fallen and a child is hurt. There is someone drowning in the, tur in the surf. As you move through this and other problems in the world, they are not happening in the timeless now. But when you are aware of the timeless now, its law through your living consciousness can become the law of all that surrounds you. You are glorifying the timeless now of God, which is ever-present everywhere, until finally you are not separated from it, and you recognize that yourself is the timeless now. Not I and, but I am that. Everywhere you go is the timeless now of reality, and you can call it yourself, because it is. You are putting on the garment of immortality now. Immortality is not after you die. That's a misconception of the human mind. Immortality is now outside the passing second. Mortality is only in the passing seconds. Choose ye. 
your immortal self in the timeless now and you will discover solutions to all those things that concern you in your immortal sense of self. Otherwise, you're going to have a false sense of progress. You're going to solve things and find you didn't really. The solutions become obsolete. Or you solve this problem, but the next one now comes. Your immortal self is a reality now. It isn't waiting for tomorrow before it begins to live in that day. It has a different time span than your mortal self. And so you're moving from this mortal sense of self to your immortal self, which has a time span called eternity. For a while you may have progressive states of expanding your time span, but finally you will come to your eternal time span. And you will see that your eternal time span embraces all the time that ever was, is, or will be. Your eternal time span goes beyond all the centuries that will ever come into the passing moment. And truly, you can live consciously in your eternal time span and watch how beautifully it functions the image in time called your mortal self. Wasn't it Jesus who said, follow me? And here he's saying, I am leaving this world. And so to follow, you must know how. You can leave the world too, and you just did when you touched your immortal self. But we're not going to touch that for a fleeting instant. Our transition depends on the knowledge and the experience of living as an immortal self, not a mortal who dies in time. Yours is the first resurrection, which eliminates the second death. Now we're still on this coastline going up, and here's this boy drowning. What are we to do? Do we pray to God? That's a good way to lose the boy. But will you accept what God has told you? That the kingdom of God is within you? And that's where you must go. This within is where you find the kingdom which you were told to seek first. And it turns out to be your own immortal self. Now who's that boy out there drowning in the, in the surf? That's an image in passing time. You can call it anything you want that for you covers the subject of its illusory nature in passing time. We used to call it mortal mind, we call it world mind. Science is coming up with holograms or discovering that holograms have been here for 40 years. And we are noticing that these holograms which Jesus taught us were nothing but images in the mind called people, images in our time sense, are subject to the law of this world because that's where they live. But where that time image appears to be, it isn't. There's no boy drowning in the surf. Your time sense tells you that. But it only tells you that because you are living in your time sense and not in your eternal time span. If you could see that boy with the eye of your soul, which lives in the eternal time span, you wouldn't see a dying boy. 
you would see that all that is there is an image in the mind of man. And what is there is the permanent now immortal self. And when you are that far, you can easily finish the truth and know that the self where that boy seems to be drowning in the surf is your own invisible immortal self. Until you come to that place where you can accept the true invisibility of everyone on earth as yourself, you are dividing the garment of the Father. You cannot be an immortal self with a space, a size, a shape, a boundary, a separation from the infinite immortal self. There is no way to separate. There you go, everywhere, and they're going to say you're drowning in the surf or falling out of the sky or that you've got a disease over there, and you can't accept it. Because everyone they're talking about is your invisible self in reality. And it, you see, has a different time span than this passing mortal instant. And I'll stretch out into that. Stretch out into your infinity into your eternal self. Go back before the beginning of a concept called you in flesh. We did that in the six mystical tapes and it should be somewhat established now that there is a you pre-existent of form, invisible, ever-present, everywhere. And that you is the you you are now. And that you extends now into every tomorrow. And that is your new time span. The you that exists before the world was, before the beginning of anything. The you that is now is the same you. The you that exists after the end of the world. The you that exists beyond every tomorrow and in every tomorrow. Eternal you is the reality of you, and there is no other you. The time-sense mortal concept of you, where the problems have been, had to be a problem area because it was such a, a minuscule fraction of what you are. Everything that you are was missing. You were lucky just to have 50% of your life with problems instead of the other 50 as well. All of you was missing because you would put your life into time unknowingly out of this world we find that self which is timeless pre-existent to all that this world appears to be existent now where the world appears to be and eternally existent in time that has not yet even arrived into our conscious knowledge. So that the next hour isn't what we wait for in order to live in it. Our self already is in it, and the next hour is not there at all. Our self is already in the 21st century, and truly you can live consciously in that awareness that there is no 21st century it's just a concept about yourself which already is there. And that thereness cannot be separated from this hereness or from yesterday because all is one now. The yesterday disappears into the now which is extended from this moment through all moments in so-called past. The now is without any form of division forever. And it is not a blank corridor. It is your living self. If we must be mundane, trust it to run your business. Trust it to do everything for you that is necessary. Trust it not just for 
you. Don't pin down this mortal self to benefit from your immortal self. Trust it to be the immortal self of the universe, of everyone you know. Leave no one out, the saint or the sinner. Trust your immortal self and the immortal self of Joel to be the one and the same. Trust the immortal self of Buddha to be the same immortal self of you. And then take a beggar in the street and trust his immortal self and yours to be identical. If you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. This isn't being big. This isn't being tolerant. This is living in truth, which takes care of all the rest. And so persistently, relentlessly, the Master takes us out of the world, and people have said, someday we're going to be in another world. Someday we're going to find that kingdom in the sky. Someday things will be better. Someday we will be redeemed. Someday he will lead us to the Father's house. And he already has. Someone wrote me that they felt a second self emerging, as if they were living two lives. I was so happy. That's what it feels like. That second self is the eternal self coming into bud. You're becoming aware of it also means that to some degree you've withdrawn from the false sense of self. And then you find the you who was running the business never was you in the first place. There was behind it all an invisible self saying, come unto me. I will give thee rest. I will give thee harmony. I will show you a way called the way of the Christ. I will lead you out of the passing moments called mortality. I will show you my Father's kingdom. But seek me first, not in the hereafter. Don't wait for this form to go. In your consciousness, let it go. And so if we look at some of the passages that we misread, thinking they were telling us to put a bolt on the door, to tell our family goodbye, to tell our clients we can't handle their work anymore, nothing like that was intended. It was to open you to your self that was neither born nor can die the self that never knows pain, the self that looks at old age or aging process and doesn't see it, the self that has never been in pain, the self that has never participated in a war, the self that never sacrificed a son to a war, and to find out that that self is the very self of the son that you may have thought you sacrificed to a war to find out that every pain that anyone has ever suffered and that we will continue to suffer is always in that false peeling off passing second and not in the self. John tells us not to love the world and I'd like you to see he means it in the light we've been discussing. Let's get his exact statement. Neither, this is John 2, 15. Neither love the world, nor the things in the world. Whoever loves the world has not the love of the Father in his heart. What a strange statement. Whoever loves the world 
has not the love of the Father in his heart. Well, you can't go around hating everybody you see, so it can't mean that. You can't hate to be a success in this world, so it can't mean that. What does it mean? If you have the love of the world in you, you do not have the love of God in your heart. In other words, you cannot recognize this passing world as the reality. That's loving the world, putting your life into it, thinking that your life depends on the activities of your body in this world. That's loving the world. It's not loving God. And it even goes so far as to say, if you accept the reality of the world, that's loving the world. If you accept the reality of the world, the love of the Father is not in your heart. And why would that be? If God had created the world. Do you see how subtly we're told this world is not your father's creation? That the hypnotism of the sense mind has recreated the kingdom of God into an illusion called this world which exists only in the hypnotized mind which recreated it. And you're pouring your life into that world and loving it. And it says here, the love of the Father is not in your heart if that is what you are doing because you are not awake to the illusion of the passing moment called the world. Because all that is in the world, remember that word all, all that is in the world is not of the Father. We could look at that all day in our human sense mind and just nod and smile and think we were being blessed almost, as the world has done, instead of seeing that it's telling us that all that is in the world is not of the Father. And I'd hate to think that you're going to walk out of this seminar right back into a world and then not have the love of the Father in your heart and pouring your life into a world that is not of the Father. How much more rewarding it would be to accept this as the will of God expressing, saying, love not the world, but love the kingdom. For all that is in the kingdom is of the Father. And I have placed the kingdom within you. That kingdom is the self of you that is going to be here when this world is no more. When this world is no more, that self of you that will be here then is here now. And you will be conscious of it then when you become conscious of it here. Now there should be a response within us that I must be that self which does not love the world. I must be that self which is not taken in by the appearances of the world, the good ones and the bad ones, or in this treadmill of time. Because I have no choice if I wish to obey the Father. If I wish to be one with the Father, I'm being told here that I'm in Tunis when I'm not out of the world. All of my personal ambitions are of no value. They do not take me into the kingdom. They keep me in the world. All of the things that I want to possess in the world keep me from oneness with the Father. And yet I don't have to give them up. I have to see through the material things of this world, through the perishables, through the things in passing time that die. 
And so my life doesn't depend on those things. My life is independent of them. My life depends on no man, no human power, no thing. My life doesn't depend on a loaf of bread. If I never eat again of food of this world, my life will still be living. That life, to become conscious of that life, is not to love the world. But if you love your life in this world, you're loving the wrong life. And you've got two lives where only one is. And so this life in you, which is your ever life, your now life, your before the world life, your after the world life, your during the world life, one continuous life, this is what should be coming alive in your consciousness. Because it is where the power of God functions. In your permanent now life, omnipotence is and nowhere else. And so that drowning boy out there recognized as your now permanent life, not separated from your life here, this is where the power flows. This is where the waves subside. This is where the disciples see the master walking on the water. You won't walk on the water, but Christ will. Because the life you accept invisibly is called Christ. And it walks invisibly upon the water, and the boy does not drown. Do you see how the releasing to your invisible life is the law of everything important? That's why constantly we are told not to love the world. Once you love the world, it's going to be very difficult to stop loving the water as it comes upon the shore. And then the next thing you know, the boy in the water is drowning. And you've got this belief upon belief which you're stuck with. You've accepted the reality of something, and now it's turned into something distressing. But you can't get rid of it. You've accepted the reality of it. You can instantly see through the unreality of the material world because you love the world. You love it enough to say to God, if you didn't make it, you should have. It's a beautiful place. You love it so much that you're calling God a second mind. You're telling God, you don't really know what you're talking about. Why shouldn't I love this world? Look at all the beauty out there. But God isn't saying that. God is saying, see through the passing nature of that beauty. I made nothing that dies. Nothing that dies was ever created by God. And yet where everything dies, my kingdom is and my life is and my immortal reality is. Look through the dying self to the eternal. And there it is. But it is you. And this is the nature of the invisible Christ of your being. The invisible self of you is now the life of everyone who has ever died in this world. And everyone who is still unborn into this world. And you will have to know that. You will have to establish that, that every child that will ever be born in every tomorrow is actually your invisible life. Everyone who seemingly has passed on into yesterday is living as your invisible life. There's only one. That's all part of your kingdom. And if you want omnipotence to work, you have to live in your kingdom because that's where it works. You can't live in this world then and expect favors from God. 
because God is specifically telling you, love not this world. God is specifically telling you that this is not my world. My kingdom is not of this world. And so once more you're seeing the division which the senses make between eternity and the illusion of time. You have lived in time most of your human sense life. The new principle of this seminar is to live outside time, consciously, in your immortal self. That doesn't mean all the wrinkles will disappear from your face tomorrow. It doesn't mean that suddenly you're going to want to go out and jog if you haven't been doing it for 20 years. But it does mean that a new law will begin to take precedence in your life, a subtle law. I come quickly. When you think not, the bridegroom cometh. In other words, knowing the truth is keeping your lamps lit. And if you're conscious that you are the life that is now and was before the world and is after the world, you're beginning to understand Jesus' statement of before Abraham was, I am. And I will be with you until the end of the world. And then you will be with me. In other words, there are no margins on your being. Every boundary, every limitation, every place where you allegedly end or begin is false. There's no up and there's no down. There's no in and there's no out. And there's no age in yourself. Because, you see, God is not a day older today as we think we are. And God's not going to have a, another birthday at a certain time next year. The infinite eternal always is. And it should be more real to you as your being. Now then, if you learn to live outside time consciously, you'll still be here, you'll still be running a business, you'll still have a family, you'll still have civic responsibilities, you can still be a great scientist, you can be a great lecturer, you can be a great theologian, you can be a great author. You can be anything in this world provided spirit is doing it and you are not. Provided you are not taking the play away from your immortal self, but letting it have its will through you so that your outer image is the an x-ray of your inner consciousness so that your immortal self is appearing to the world as Jesus the Christ or someone running a hospital or someone running a, an architect's firm or someone running a legal firm, that immortal self of you will express as these things. But if it is not, you have no foundation in your permanent self and the love of the Father will not express in your heart. I know you can accept this. I also know that you can yield to it because it is revealing a greater you. And if we have not seen the greater works that were promised by Jesus, it is because they were not to be in time. The works that I do, you shall do in time, but greater works shall ye do outside of time. That's where the greater works are. Because if a thing doesn't originate outside time, it can never come into a, an appearance in time. The scene is always outside time. And then in the tomorrows that seem to be in the future, the nowness of your perfect self outside time then expresses and appears in that so-called future time that appears in the present. You sow the seeds of every day in future time by living in the now-ness of your immortal self. And if you've been missing that glorious power in your life, 
You haven't lost it. It's always there. You simply haven't used it or let it use you. But it's there with no diminishing possibility. If you were to go out tomorrow and become a murderer, it could not leave you. And so I'm sure that with lesser problems than you, that you have encountered and a lesser way of uh, being perfect, you certainly haven't lost what even a murderer cannot lose. In other words, no matter what your present condition in this mortal lifespan, and there are no exceptions, you may think it's beyond redemption, but the Spirit of God is not you, and it forgives seventy times seven, and the forgiveness means I erase, I blot out, I dissolve, I remove. All that is unlike myself when you come unto me. And so I say to you that wherever you are in consciousness, if you make another step into your immortal self now and try through your meditations to come to the realization of it where it actually expresses, independent of your thinking mind, you will discover you don't have to say, I've got a pain on the left side or the right, or my kneecap isn't functioning correctly, or I didn't make any sales this month. You won't have to say that. You won't have to think that. In fact, you'd better not. Because the minute you do, you have lost your immortal self. It is perfect, and its perfection extends from the invisible into the visible to the degree that you remove your visible concept of yourself in passing time. 